his work in informing the community about the, um, the uh, efforts of the Koch organization. So uh, uh, we'll turn it over to you, Dr. Dr. Deal. Thanks, Kay. Yeah, hiking got kind of curtailed by the big horn fire, unfortunately. Are you hearing me okay? Yeah, so yeah, you're good. There have been problems at times. Yeah, we're hoping the uh, National Forest will open up again on first as promised, but we'll see. Well, I'm gonna start out today by giving an overview of the vast Coke influence machine. There's really only one Coke now that we need to be concerned with, Charles. His brother David died in August. So the Cokes are, have dwindled to the one guy, but he's quite enough to handle. He's been very successful in amplifying his money and his ideology through organizing a big network of organizations. And I'm gonna start out by reading a passage from a recent book called State Capture by a political scientist at Columbia. And I'll just give you a little context before I read the passage. It talks about seminars. Well, that's the, the Coke term for semi-annual donor summits where they recruit money and organize it, direct it toward their political goals. So the first thing to know about the Koch machine is that Charles Koch and before his brother died, that's David, uh, they were very successful in weaponizing money, I think you could say, in organizing it, giving it a goal, um, creating organizational forms through which it could act effectively. I'm not saying that there aren't other big money people out there, for instance, the Bradley Foundation, Betsy DeVos, Mercer, the Scape Foundation, the Coors, that also are players on the right. But the thing about the Coke machine is the degree of organization and focus and also kind of institutional continuity that it has managed to achieve. Okay, so that's the background for this passage. This will give you an idea of the scale that we're talking about. And as I said, this is from State Capture. So the Koch seminars have quickly become an incredibly influential source of fundraising for the right. While concrete numbers are hard to come by, this is typical in this area, they attempt to hide their activities and where the money is going. While concrete numbers are hard to come by, the brothers have at times either publicly disclosed the total pledges they have received from their donors at these seminars, or that information has leaked to the press following seminar convenings. Okay, so we're talking about four or 500 basically business leaders getting together. These are big conferences. In 2007 to 2008, the seminars raised just shy of $100 million. In 2009 to 2010, that number grew to over $150 million. By 2011 to 2012 to $400 million. More recently, the Cokes pledged to raise between 700 and $900 million between 2015 and 2016, with another three to 400 million for the 2018 cycle. These sums are vast on their own and become even more impressive when we compare them to the money the GOP has raised in recent years. In 2015 to 2016, the Republican Party raised just over $850 million, or about the same amount of money the Cokes plan to raise privately for the same election cycle. The Koch network, it is fair to say, is playing on the same field as an entire political party. Other writers on the subject have come to the same conclusion, I can add. Okay, so I think that gives us an idea of why this is a big deal. I'll, I will say that it's very hard to figure just where the outer edges of the Coke influence end and merge with the influence of other hyper wealthy people. But we're dealing with a web of personal contacts, uh, cooperation, sometimes clashes, a very complex society up in the billionaire sphere, which I have no direct contact with 
And we really have to depend on researchers like the author of the book I was just reading from, Alexander Herzl Fernandez. Okay, so uh, that book spends quite a bit of time describing uh, the structure and history of what Alex calls the right-wing troika. And I will add a fourth to the troika. So, you know, a fourth horse, so to speak. I'll get to that in just a second. The main players are ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, which I'm sure all of you have heard of, or most of you anyway. They're basically a model bill factory. They send out model bills to state legislators all over the country. They have unfortunately a fairly good success rate in getting their bills passed at the state level. Uh, the Koch brothers, or now the Koch brother, singular, uh, sit on the board of ALEC and have a considerable influence over its policies, but they do not directly control it to the degree that they control one of the uh, organizations I'll be getting to. That's because ALEC represents pretty specifically business interests. Uh, the Cokes, the Coke now, have a very big business empire, particularly in fossil fuels, refining, pipelines, uh, fertilizer production, which involves petrochemicals, and other things like Georgia Pacific, which they snapped up some years back, which is big into paper, and actually is directly contacted by us as consumers, unlike most of the uh, products that the Coke uh, industries are involved with. Okay, so um, the, uh, excuse me just a moment. Okay, so I was talking about ALEC. It's basically a pay to play organization. There are lots of task forces focusing on different issues, uh, often deregulation, tax cuts that are advantageous to the business interests involved. Um, so there were problems in the early years of the organization. It goes back actually eventually to the 70s. And they uh, resolved the problems by allowing the uh, corporation essentially that contributes the most money to determine the policy of the task force. So that simplified matters consistently. Okay, they are a, a major force here in Arizona with our conservative uh, legislators who still unfortunately control our legislature. And of course uh, also hold the governorship. Um, they uh, are a big factor really right around the country. So that, that's one member of the so-called Troika. The next one that I'll talk about is the State Policy Network. This is a network of think tanks. It goes back to the 80s, mid 80s, I think, when it was called the Madison Group. Alec played a big role in nurturing it in the early years when it wasn't doing very well because it was fighting for funding with other right-wing organizations and causes. So the director of ALEC saw the advantages of fostering a network of research institutes that could put out uh, articles, policies, and exert political pressure in favor of the pro-business pol policies that ALEC was pursuing. So it turned into the state policy network in the 90s. And now I think it has affiliates in nearly all, perhaps all states. Um, one of the most powerful affiliates and one of the best funded is our very own Goldwater Institute here in Arizona. And there are an interesting couple of pages in state capture specifically on the Goldwater Institute. Um, the, I think former vice director of the Goldwater Institute, I may not have his title exactly right, was put on the state Supreme Court by Ducey in 2016, that's Clint Bullock. That's just an example of the close connections between elected conservatives and the state policy network, a particularly close connection. So the state policy network uh, also includes the Cato Institute, which the Kochs got started. Uh, that's a big one. I think one sees its name often in the media. So uh, the Mercatus Center at GMU George Mason University in Virginia, right outside DC, uh, that's a big player. The Cokes 
uh, it's often called Coke Central. The Cokes do have donated over a hundred million dollars to GMU. Uh, there is a, a fairly significant anti-Coke movement at GMU also. Uh, so the, the battle is joined there. But uh, the Mercatus Center cranks out lots of articles, lots of videos fighting for the extreme right-wing libertarian ideology of, of Charles Koch. Okay, so the State Policy Network is another major player. And here I think one begins to get more centrally into the sphere that the Koch has pretty direct control of, but not total. So the third member of the Troika, as Alex Hurdle Fernandez describes it in his book, is uh, the um, Americans for Prosperity. This formed a little, I think about 2004, it was born out of Citizens for a Sound Economy. There was a disagreement between the Koch brothers and the then head of Citizens for a Sound Economy. And it was basically as usual uh, between the Koch desire to have total control and the desire of the person running the organization to retain some control for himself and they could not agree. So Americans for Prosperity was cre created. It's often called an astroturf group. If you're familiar with that term, you know, it pretends to be grassroots. In fact, it does have a lot of boots on the ground, citizen volunteers. I have, one has to concede that. A lot of them who came in for the, from the Tea Party after 2010. So yeah, there are actual people who uh, actually have a strongly conservative leanings will turn up in state capitals by the thousands sometimes to put pressure on legislators. They are not, uh, you know, just clones created by AFP. Uh, they do have an independent existence. On the other hand, Americans for Prosperity is directly scripted by Charles Koch. It is a totally top-down organization which runs kind of, kind of in a quasi-military style to turn out large crowds to intimidate legislators. Of course, you know, we, we left-wingers or centrists also try to turn out large crowds to uh, persuade or pressure legislators, so fair enough. But I'd say the difference here is the way that uh, Koch scripts Americans for Prosperity. It's not grassroots at all in that sense. And also the amount of money behind it. It's been a major factor, for instance, in uh, Wisconsin in 2011, uh, the Iowa election, I think that was around then, uh, in promoting anti-labor policies and so on. So those are the three members of the Troika. Uh, they are strong, not just because specifically Coke money goes into them, but because Coke has, has managed to recruit vastly more money in order to support these organizations. They're also strong simply because they're organized and sometimes quite well run, it varies. Uh, some of the AFP affiliates are not very well funded or very strong. Others are, I would say about 500 pound gorillas with uh, you know Coke uh, being the 800 pounder in the room. Okay, the, the fourth player as I see it, and I'm kind of prejudiced here, is the network of on-campus academic centers that the Cokes have gotten started or helped get start. There are over 300 of them on American campuses. And of course, they claim that this is needed as a counterweight to the supposedly liberal bias of our universities, which is, a, I think, a favorite conservative myth. But uh, they are basically political operations funded by right-wing money using the platform of our often public universities to gain prestige and credibility. And I will get into details about the one here at the University of Arizona later on. But, I, but as I said, there are well over 300 of them. Um, they are definitely a very large beachhead for the right in our universities. And we view their activities as contrary to the mission of a university, which is to promote uh, diversity of thought, yes, but on a level playing field, and not one, not a diversity of thought where one of the actors is basically an arm of uh, one of the major political parties, the Republican in this case. 
So I guess before I go on to uh, what's happening right here in Tucson, well, and also Arizona, and the group that I'm treasurer of, I just want to you know, give a, a brief summary of the things that the Coke machine works against. Basically, public services in general, with the exception of the police, the military, and the judiciary. The judiciary, they are actively engaged in taking over, working through the Federalist Society, which has kind of superseded the American Bar Association, which used to have the say on who was qualified for the, uh, the federal bench or other lower benches. It's now the Federalist Society, which I'm sure you've most of you, maybe all of you have heard of. Okay, so, <clears throat> excuse me. The, um, yeah, as I was saying, there's a general ideological opposition coming from Charles Koch and his allies to public services in general. That includes public education, that's a big one. Healthcare, which they desire to be totally privatized along with public education even from the more extreme members of this particular group of people, all the way down to public health services. So anything that is funded by our tax money to benefit the public good is viewed as inimical to freedom, which is one of their favorite code words. So generally speaking, anybody from the center to the left of the American public political spectrum is going to be for something that the Cokes are against. So, you know, this is a, a major push against the very idea of a society in which there's a public spirit, in which government works for the public good. Indeed, um, they attack even the notion of a public good. It's a free market fundamentalism in which members of society or society are atomized, isolated individuals, basically consumers, and the invisible hand of the free market, to use Adam Smith's phrase from 250 years ago, I guess, is supposed to somehow solve all problems. Um, to me, and the people I'm working with, this is fantasy land, but Koch and his allies cling you know, quite firmly to the notion that economic freedom is the heart of all freedom. And that any kind of encroachment on say the rights of corporations to do with it as they please is an encroachment on freedom. Okay, so now I wanna talk a little bit about our local group here and the University of Arizona and the situation in Arizona generally. Okay, so as I mentioned, I'm treasurer of the local group Cox Off Campus. And as you can tell from the name, we focused on the academic center at the University of Arizona. There are also academic centers at ASU and more recently one at Northern Arizona University in Flagstaff. Uh, in the, latter, the last case, uh, people basically, uh, the, the uh, Coke machine took over an existing non-ideological organization, which was kind of a economic literacy program and have converted it, it into another freedom center. These centers all have been subsidized for several years now directly by the state legislature. In other words, they are using our tax dollars to pay to support these institutes. We think this is objectionable in itself. In addition, the monies that they have directed toward these centers have been a direct line item over which the several universities involved have no control. The money does not go into the university general budget. It is to go directly to the centers. They have total control over how it is used. Well, some of the ways it has been used has been to buy half a million dollars in rare books, including I think a uh, first edition of Adam Smith's uh, Wealth of Nations and uh, other choice kind of scriptural items from the point of view of the right wing. It's also been used to fund student trips to India, 
up at ASU in order to try to attract more enrollment for the courses that the center there is offering. And it has been used to put into the bank. The Freedom Center here at uh, the University of Arizona has a bank balance of $9 million that they have not managed to spend, that they've accumulated during the, I think five years now, four for sure, during which they've been directly funded by the state of, state of Arizona. Okay, another reason that we object to their activities and to the fact that they're on campus in the uh, building that houses the School of Behavioral and Social Sciences is that they have been actively working on and have succeeded in creating a textbook and course on economics, principally economics, for use in high schools and also as an entry level course at the university level. So these are dual enrollment courses. They offer students the opportunity to acquire university credits at a heavily discounted rate. Now, we've read <laughs> the original version of the textbook and I've read the revised version that came out last year. We've also had both versions of the textbook reviewed by an eminent professor of economics at the University of Oregon, Oregon Eugene, sorry. Um, he was quite scathing about the textbooks, noting for instance, that there is no mention in either version of the Great Depression or of the Great Recession of 2007 and eight. In other words, they do not discuss the great market failures. The connection. Sorry? Hello? Okay. They do not discuss the great examples of market failure of the last century. They do not acknowledge that they are presenting a particular version of economics and that there are others. Uh, for instance, Keynesianism to which governments regularly resort in times of emergency as ours did back in 2007 to eight. Uh, there are many other specific problems with the textbook. The, basically the problem is not just the bias of the textbook, which is considerable, but the fact that the bias is not acknowledged. And this textbook is supposed to be for high school students and basically entering freshmen. So we consider that rather unethical and also improper from an intellectual and scholarly point of view. Uh, very recently, uh, the director of the Freedom Center here, David Schmitz, attempted yet again to get the course turned into a general education course at the university. It had attracted virtually no enrollment for the last several years. So this was an obvious ploy to try to get large numbers of students enrolled in order to sat satisfy their general education requirement. Uh, one of the members of our group, David Gibbs, who's a professor of history at the university, went and testified. We also sent uh, the a copy, emailed a copy of uh, the professor at uh, University of Oregon's review to everybody on the committee, and they said no. <laughs> this is the third time Schmitz had tried this gambit and it looks like this was a definite no, we hope so. Okay, this course is actually down in Mexico, in Monterey specifically, and also other places in Northern Mexico. And we know from documents we've obtained through public records requests that Schmitz and his backers, the Kochs and so on, would like to create an international empire of introductory economics courses in order to propagandize um, K through 12 students. There are even plans to create curricular materials for elementary school. And we recently saw um, the pick the cover at least of one such textbook. It looked like it was aimed at about the fifth grade. In addition, the uh, Freedom Center here has ideas about creating a major called PPE, uh, PPEL is actually their version, standing for, uh, let me see, philosophy, politics, economic, economics, and law. Uh, that began at Oxford in the 1920s. It was intended and still is to be a course for high level civil service people in the government, uh, quite a prestigious major actually. So the uh, 
the right wing, the Koch libertarian right wing, would like to use that major internationally. I mean, they've been working in Australia, for instance, uh, also Africa, in order to push their particular version, not just of economics, but of the proper social order in their view. So the, um, the L has been added, standing for law, because they are also interested in pushing the law and economics view of law, not just in this course, but generally through the Federalist Society. They do seminars for judges in very nice resorts, bring your family, there are family activities provided, all expenses paid. They have managed to get a lot of our judges up at the federal level to attend these seminars. Uh, how effective they are, I'm not sure, but obvious, the intent is obvious. So, sorry. The, um, <clears throat> the law and economics view is kind of, uh, kind of pushes a cost benefit analysis. In other words, the, the idea is to monetize the actual effects of a legal decision instead of looking at a legal decision, say in a federal appeals case as a matter of rights, which cannot be quantified in dollars and cents. So their take on how our judiciary should function includes the same economistic version of human beings and human society that you get generally in what they're pushing. So um, I mentioned that they have a high school course and it's actually down in Mexico. Uh, they had people in from Somali actually and Uganda during the pilot project for the course back around 2015. Another example of how they hope to have an international reach. Anyway, this course was kind of smuggled into the Tucson Unified School District curriculum without going through proper channels. Uh, we were able to get it thrown out in December of 2018, finally after a struggle of many months. And we also managed to create enough of a stink over an Amphi School District for them to decide that there wasn't enough student interest in it to justify giving it again. So we're fighting that course in local school districts and have had the two successes I just described. It's also in private schools where one has very little power to change things. Another reason that uh, public education seems like a really good thing to defend, along with many other reasons. There are various schools up in Maricopa County as well. So we're trying to monitor what's going on on this front nationally. There's a national group called Uncoke My Campus that started at George Mason University as Transparency GMU about seven years ago. And uh, they've been doing research into the influence of the Cokes on the national level and uh, organizing, well, helping support organizing on various campuses around the country. So uh, we're an affiliate of them and uh, we're trying to expand the network, raise awareness. Um, there's an ever growing number of campuses where there's some resistance going on not as many campuses as I would like to see, but some. Uh, MIT specifically has been organizing recently. Both David and Charles graduated from there. I think Charles has multiple degrees in engineering from MIT. And there are a huge presence at MIT, which I didn't know. Uh, there's even a childcare center there bearing the Coke name. So that's, that's one of the recent additions to the, the uh, network of resistance to the Cokes on campuses. And finally, right here at the University of Arizona, as you may know, uh, a coalition for academic, academic justice at the U of A has formed. Um, associated with it, I would say there's a union lo local now of the Communication Workers of America. Uh, there are, I think, well over 400 members and the membership is growing rapidly. Um, and they had a State of the Union presentation Tuesday this week, I think it was. And at the end of it, after going through I, what I thought was a really excellent set of presentations on why the university administration has been behaving very improperly, 
and basically continuing to ignore its obligation to share governance, governance with the faculty and why its decisions have been financially disastrous and why its decision to reopen the campus has been disastrous from a public health standpoint and so on and so forth. They said that there were some topics they couldn't get to. And the first one they mentioned was corruption at the Freedom Center. So we were very happy to hear that that is something that they are likely to take up because the goal of our group here is to get that center off campus, as our name says. If, it, if they want to support it with private money, that's their right. But in integrating it into a public university and on top of it, getting it supported with taxpayer money is really unacceptable. So on the, the point of the taxpayer subsidy to these centers, the Democratic Party here in Arizona in its proposed budget earlier this year, at last, after years of not doing it, said that they want to zero out funding for the so-called freedom schools, which is what the legislature calls them in its legislations, legislation. It wants to zero out funding for them in the budget. Of course, that didn't happen this year, but there's a chance that, uh, a good chance, I would say, that the state house will be flipped. It was, it's only 29 and 31. Democrat Republican right now. There's even an outside chance that the Senate could be flipped. So we're hoping that the Democratic Party will come into power and that it will in fact act upon its decision to pursue zeroing out funding for the freedom schools. That uh, of course is not gonna do away with an, ent an entity that has $9 million in the bank very quickly, but it would be a start in the right direction and probably would help um, the push to get the Freedom School off the UA campus and get its um, counterpart at NAU and at ASU out of their system as well. Okay, so I've been talking for a while. Um, I'd like to throw things open for questions and discussion now. So Kay, are you gonna moderate or Oliver? Or? Um, sure, I can. Um, I, I'll, I'll, ask, I'll ask the question. I, I don't understand um, how, how, how the Cokes got such a deal where they get to do all their stuff and then, and then have it paid for by us. <laughs> well, there's a uh, of the, I think it's called the, the Freedom Caucus which is a national organization in the legislature here. And the members of that caucus have pushed very hard for funding the Freedom Schools. Ducey is quite demonstrably a Koch creature if you look at his funding and who supported him. So they've got some pretty powerful friends at court, you might say. Um, I, I could add that the Freedom Center, officially it's called the Center for the philosophy of freedom, but everybody just says the Freedom Center. Okay, they got started really as the Freedom Program in 2004. At that point, it was Randy Kendrick, who is the wife of the owner of the Arizona Diamondbacks and very wealthy, who was the main backer. Uh, we have, however, gotten through public records requests what is virtually a love letter from Randy to Charles Koch. Uh, some reason it was in the files at the University of Arizona. So our fishing expedition turned it up. So anyway, there was a strong connection, kind of idolatry, I would say, between Randy and, and Charles. So for four years, it ran as the free program, and then it was turned into the Center for the Philosophy of Freedom. And during these years and on up to about 2015, it was funded by private money from various wealthy donors, Randy Kendrick being one of them. I think the Ellers also are in there. Uh, the, uh, the Templeton Foundation coughed up nearly $3 million. I didn't mention this, $2.9 million to develop that textbook and course. <laughs> and the textbook was really a miserable performance. I mean, we were joking in our group that the Templeton Foundation should have demanded their money back given the lack of care and attention that went into that 
the textbook. The second version is a little more presentable. But anyway, so for 10 years, maybe a little more private money backed it. And then the people in the legislature, no doubt Ducey as well, succeeded in really improving the Coke return on investment. No longer do private donors bear the burden <laughs> of supporting the freedom schools, or at least the primary burden. The taxpayers are being made to pay for entities that are working against public education, against the good public health care system, and so on. So anyway, that I don't I think there are a couple of other states where there's a much milder version of this going on, where public monies are being used to fund the freedom schools in those states. But Arizona definitely is leading the way here, just as in so many other ways lately. Uh, so that, that's basically the answer, as far as we understand it, of how they got their way in. And by the way, Mark Fincham, in uh, you know the rep state representative up in Oro Valley, is one of the main backers, quite clearly, of the Freedom School here. We also learned that from documents we got through Freedom of Information requests. Okay, so not quite Tucson, but pretty close. Mm -hmm. Wow, well, um, that, 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 that's just, so it's different in every state as, as far as the amount of taxpayer support that he gets. Okay, I was just talking about Mark Fincham up in Oro Valley as a major backer of the, uh, the Freedom Schools. He's in the Freedom Caucus. And there are a bunch of other extreme right wingers up in the legislature. So I, I think, you know, what's gone on is that they've had a few, uh, you know, rabid supporters in the legislature. And it's not that big a deal to the rest of the GOP members of the legislature. So that there's this group, I would estimate of maybe 10, I'm just guessing roughly, who really want the Freedom Schools supported in order to fight back against the left wing takeover of our universities. That's their line, basically. Mm -hmm. the other legislatures have probably just gone along with it. Kind of symmetrically on the Democratic side, there are a number of legislators who are really opposed to this kind of subsidizing of a propaganda arm for the Republican Party on our campuses. Um, then I think there are quite a few members of the Democratic delegation who really don't care that much about it one way or the other. And there are what in our group we call the corporate Dems, uh, people who are Democrats, yes, but they're backed by much the same interests that back a lot of the Republicans. So uh, party affiliation is not necessarily determinative, I think, here. Hopefully, as I said, if the Democratic Party gets control of the legislature next year, the Democratic Party will stick together and remove the from the Freedom Schools. But we shall see. We're certainly going to work for that. Um, I I know in one discussion, one one Zoom meeting I had with uh, some members of the legislature, they they seem to be um, really hopeful that they're going to gain control in January. Uh, um, uh, you know, for, for the Jan session beginning in January, and and um, and they, uh, uh, you know, they're they're very hopeful about that. Um, there's a question that Oliver put here on in the chat. Uh, when you mention the Ellers, is that the same as the um, Eller School at the business at the U of A? Yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, <laughs> David Schmitz. I mentioned him. He's the director of the Freedom Center. He's been the central figure from 2004 on back when it was the Freedom Program. Uh, he was the one pushing to make the uh, high school slash uh, entry level university course into a general education course. Okay, uh, here's an example of what we have learned from a surreptitious recordings of a Coke sponsored um, conference. Here's an example of, you want a director who embodies the will of the donor, okay? So he is totally aligned with ideologically with what Charles Koch wants. And he has attempted to implement that, well, for over 15 years now through the Freedom Program and, and now the uh, Freedom School, uh, sorry, the Freedom Center. So. Um, <laughs> um, 
Um, there's another question here from Connie. She wants, wants to know if you can provide the specific names of the textbooks that you were discussing at the grade school level. Um, we have just seen a screenshot of the cover of the particular item I mentioned. I think this is a very new initiative. Um, you know, I would have to do some digging to, you know, learn more about this. I will mention, though, that the uh, Freedom Center here took ownership of Take Charge USA very recently. It was in the School of Agriculture here. It was basically a financial literacy program. Uh, it seemed to be pretty nonpartisan, as long as it was controlled by the Ag School. It gave them access to a database involving the, uh, the uh, email addresses and names of about 15,000 teachers around the country. So we're very apprehensive about this. And this is the area where I, you know, I was mentioning needing to, needing to do some more digging. And we're really going to have to enlist the help of the national level organization, because this is kind of a, a big deal, you know, uh, a very large network. And to do the investigation is going to take a fair amount of, uh, you know, person hours. But uh, we're definitely on the alert about this. Up till now, they've really focused on the high school level. Mm. But it looks like maybe shifting their ground. And we know from various documents we've obtained, they're very interested in changing attitudes as early as possible. <laughs> right. Right. Um, so uh, uh, another question from Clay, uh, he, he wants to know what, what level, how can he find out about the level of influence that the Cokes have in the schools in the state of Louisiana? Wow, okay. Uh, well, we couldn't tell you you could probably go to uncokemycampus.org and ask them, but I'm not sure they're gonna know either because we've been pestering them to find out what's going on in other states. And they have come up with very little in, the, in terms of either a textbook or an actual course. It seems like the Freedom Center here at the University of Arizona is the nerve center so far for the Coke-backed effort to get its propaganda into the schools. So we're sitting right in the middle of it here. And they, they actually started out up in Kansas. They did a pilot program there. Uh, they, they, they used a private school, as you can imagine, that would be more straightforward. But it turned out the private school students weren't very interested in their curricular materials, which were pushing entrepreneurship um, sometimes pretty humble entrepreneurship. And the students at the private school came from fairly moneyed families. I think that kind of life path wasn't all that attractive to them. Uh, Kansas is, of course, where the Coke family is from. There's a book called Sons of Wichita, which apparently is quite a good uh, biographical study of, of Fred Coke and his sons. Anyway, so they started right there at Coke Central, geographically speaking, and tried private schools. That didn't turn out very well, as I just said. And it seems like the focus of the effort got shifted down here to the University of Arizona, um, you know, using their true believer, David Schmitz, as the person to try to get somewhere with the strategy. I wish I could be more definite about what's going on, but you, you have to remember, they have attempted to cover their tracks as much as possible. Ever since they, they ran David as the vice presidential candidate in 1980 for the Libertarian Party and found out there was very little popular support for their views. They decided that they need to, you know, keep undercover, do things stealthily, uh, work through backroom channels, not really let people the public know what they're up to. Of course, that makes it very hard for us to learn what they're up to. <laughs> I mentioned that uh, we learned about kind of the view on the kind of director you need for one of these centers from somebody who infiltrated a uh, conference where people were talking in what I might say is a kind of unbuttoned way, like telling the truth about what they're up to and how they hope to 
to achieve it. And that's where a panelist talked about, well, you know, the director is going to embody the, basically the will of the donor. And in that situation, you don't even need a formal written agreement, which is another thing that we focused on. There have been some really bad donor agreements uh, for Florida State University, for instance, but early on also here, where there was total violation of academic freedom, donor control over curriculum, over appointments. These are huge no-nos in academic circles, okay? Mm. Uh, you know, you have to do freedom of information requests to get the documents. And most of them are in the hands of the private foundation that is now routinely set up to support public universities. Well, a private foundation is not subject to public records law. So this is another veil to hide Coke activities or the activities of their allies. And you, you can read all about this kind of stuff in uh, what I think is now a classic book called Dark Money which probably many of you have heard of, a brilliant job of investigative uh, journalism by Jane Mayer, a regular New Yorker writer. Uh, highly recommended, though quite depressing. Uh, the way that they use the system to hide their operations, very, very clever and very effective. Um, well, yeah that, yeah, that would be, I know I haven't read that book yet, but it's, it's on my list. Um, so, um, uh, let's see, there's several other questions here. Um, uh, what, what does the second P stand for in PPEL? And, I, and, what, and what is Noam Chomsky's position input? Ah, okay. I, I know a little bit about Noam Chomsky's position. I think it's, you know, it's, it's either philosophy, politics, economics, and law, or politics, philosophy, economics, and law, okay? So politics and philosophy. <laughs> and right. And those are original with the Oxford program, which was going great guns when I was there at the end of the 60s. And I knew people in it. Excellent program, very rigorous and demanding, not propaganda for some political group or ideology at all, except I suppose you could say for uh, supporting the uh, British governmental structure and providing well-educated people to staff it. You know, I mean, one could have questions about that, I suppose, but. It was not partisan, that's for sure. And uh, yeah, and um, Chomsky, um, David Gibbs, whom I mentioned earlier, our professor of history in our group. Well, actually there's several, but he's the one who's most active. Okay, David said that he has talked to Noam about the question of outside money supporting an on-campus entity. And Noam's attitude is that take their money, and then ignore them. <laughs> oh, dear. So can do that. Um, and David's reaction to that was, well, Noam Chomsky doesn't care at all about material things. He is not after money, okay? He has plenty of status as an intellectual, right? There's nothing that money can buy him that he wants, That's David's take on him. But David feels what Noam doesn't realize is that the rest of humanity is corruptible, <laughs> unlike him. So it matters where you take the money from because you might want more money from the same source. So you start changing your behavior to make it more likely you're gonna get more money from where you're, wherever you already got it, you know? And then of course there are more direct forms of corruption. Anyway, so no, Noam has not been a person we would wanna bring onto a panel about why we should get the Freedom Center off campus because his attitude is kind of anarchist, okay? If they're stupid enough to give me money, let them, I'll use them. <laughs> um, let's see, uh, Clay has, has his hand up. Um, was that, uh, Clay, is that the same question that you had on the chat? Well, I, I, I do have one other. It's not a little less directly to this subject related with the Koch brothers. And I see them funding some certain, legitimate science programs on PBS, even ones that cover climate change. I'm wondering, what is their motivation in doing that? Hey, you know, they are certainly concerned with PR now. I mean, Jane Mayer's book, which came out, I think, in 2016, uh, was, uh, you know, very widely read and reviewed and discussed. Uh, their long-term policy of trying to, to keep out of sight and under the radar 
isn't working so well anymore. They have, they have uh, the Libre initiative where they're trying to appeal to Hispanic voters, for instance. You mentioned their funding of um, you know, valuable science programs. They've actually given money to Arizona public media right here in Tucson. Um, you know, they're spreading it around. It makes them look better. Uh, I will note the contradiction between their supporting a science program on PBS about climate change and the fact that they were in on the ground floor in fostering climate change, doubt and denialism. This is documented in Christopher Leonard's new book, Copeland. He unearthed documents showing that in 1991 under Bush one, they were involved in starting to deny climate change. The really terrible thing about this is that in 1991, the issue wasn't politicized yet, okay? So the Cokes have been important or played certainly a role in politicizing the issue. We're losing your audio again. Oh, we're losing your audio yeah. again. Can you hear me? Not yet. <laughs> okay, that's better. Ah, I can come through again? Yeah. Okay, good. Well, I was just saying that it's, it's known that the Cokes were in on the beginning of the campaign to spread doubt and disinformation about climate change. This is almost 30 years ago, and that this was before the issue was politicized. So they played a role in politicizing it, and now we are reaping the results. It should not have ever been politicized, uh, obviously. Okay, so they did that. And now they're touching. They're losing you again. Losing me again? Yeah. You hear me? That's a little better. What's going on? Okay, it's probably the Cox connection. There, there's a couple more questions in the chat. Um, one of them was uh, is uh, asking about boycotting Georgia Pacific. And uh, that that's uh, that would probably be kind of hard to comment on in chat. And the other one um, is is a question by Howard. It's kind of a long question. Um, okay, can you can you can you see the questions in the chat, Patrick? Okay. Uh, we... All right. Okay, we can hear you now. <laughs> can you still hear me? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm just going to say uh, regarding Howard's question, uh -huh. uh, they make marriages of convenience with other groups. Uh, one of the complaints that pure libertarians, if you can call them that, have with the Cokes is that they are quite willing to betray libertarian principles in order to acquire political power. For instance, they are allied with the anti-abortion movement. Uh. No, we just lost you again. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so uh, yeah, um, Howard says maybe we can reschedule Patrick for another meeting in a few months when technical issues are worked out. <laughs> Let's hope. Oh, there you are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think it's just a, a small little section of the talk that's been yeah. affected. It's just in the Q&A. Okay. Yeah. I I think we 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 got we we got the bulk of um, of your message. I think I think it was very highly appreciated. Uh, well, I have an announcement I was hoping to make. Oh, okay. Okay, I mentioned state capture at the beginning of my presentation. Its author Alexander Hurdle Fernandez will be on a panel in a webinar on the twenty eighth of this month. Okay, so if people want to hear from him directly, that would be a chance. Uh, the, the book is, given its rather heavy subject, I think the book is quite a lively read. Of course, that's my opinion. <laughs> I understand he's uh, quite good in person. Um, so anyway, I'm going to just put the uh, Uncoke My Campus. Um, so that's, that's the book, Uncoke My Campus? Oh, that's the website. Yeah, State Capture. Oh, State Capture. Right. And there'll be a webinar on the 28th. Okay, presented by the national group, Uncoke My Campus, and also by our group. 
it's also going to have at least one person from the Center for Media and Democracy on the panel. I think David Armiak is supposed to be presenting. So <laughs> I think it would be a quite an interesting uh, presentation if you're interested in more about uh, right-wing money and how it's controlling more and more in this country. And I think also some ideas about how to, how to fight back. Actually, so, the, the end of Alex's book contains a bunch of recommendations, which I think are very uh, intelligent. <laughs> uh, so, so the website is uncokemycampus.org? Yeah. OK. Yeah. And that's, that's all one word, U-N-C-O-C-H. Right. Yeah. OK. How about a, uh, a uh, uh, initiative to uh, uproot the two major parties like the Green Party <coughs> as a means to fight back? Over. Well, yeah, I think we definitely need to replace the current duopoly with uh, a party or preferably parties that represent the people. I think the Democratic Party is pretty well abandoned its former base, say, 50 years ago. Uh, Piketty's new book, Capital and Ideology, goes into great detail about just what has happened. And I, I think it's, you know, he makes a very good case that that's where we are now. So we've got an extreme right wing party. We've got a Democratic Party that represents a minority of people, does not really represent uh, people who make uh, low income people in general. And uh, does not represent their needs or interests of a very angry public out there. And they voted in Trump. And they've basically been abandoned by the party that used to represent them. This is a huge problem, <laughs> obviously. Yeah. So um, I'm actually involved with Movement for a People's Party. And like the Green Party, we're trying to uh, bust up the duopoly and get a party going that represents ordinary people. Okay, as Bernie said, uh, us and not the billionaires, right? Yeah, okay, so I'd agree with that. Uh, I just dropped a couple of links to Uncoke My Campus. Um, both to their higher ed program um, and to their events. Uh, so if anybody wants to see uh, a link to what Patrick was just talking about, uh, take a look at the chat. Okay, and, and maybe I, I'll just type in the name of kind of the main books as I see them on the subject. In yeah. case anybody really wants to dig into this, there's been some really good work done in the last few years. Uh, the, the dismaying thing is that it took till basically 2016 for what's going on to really be brought into the public eye, to really come to the surface. And this effort goes back to the 70s for sure. I didn't even talk about the Powell memo and the stuff that went on in the 70s. Um, certainly to the early 80s. So we're dealing with something that went on for 35 years succeeded in organizing money, creating powerful organizations, heavily influencing American politics, creating what is almost, you could say, a third party, not the kind we would like, right? And who knew, you know? It's amazing. It, it's, it attests to their ability at hiding what they were doing and being very effective. So anyway, I, I'll type in some book titles. Um, once you're done with that, I'm going to copy those items from the chat and put them in the Facebook event comments and the meetup comments so that uh, they're oh, accessible well, to people who've already left. Right. Good. Okay, this last one. This is on the business side of the Cokes, okay, uh, where their money comes from. And I found it very interesting. It was in that book, as I mentioned, that it came out that they, are, they were involved in climate change denialism very early on. Uh, that was known in general, but it was not known that they, they got involved that early. So it's called uh, Cokeland. Very interesting read. Um, 
I also noticed a strong parallel between how Charles Koch runs his business enterprises and how he runs his political enterprises. Uh, central control, private ownership, uh, everybody's gotta be on the same page, you know? Basically, there's a vocabulary and a set of concepts that you have to uh, adopt and make part of yourself if you wanna work for a Koch business. And Sounds like a cult. <laughs> I I've thought as I re I've read about it that, you know, Mao had the little red book and Charles Koch has a little black and white book. It's called, um, let me see, oh, damn, I'm trying to remember the name. Anyway, it's a 75 page ma manual that everybody who joins the business organization basically has to memorize and everybody has to talk in the terms that are prescribed by this little white book black and white book. <laughs> wow, that's that's one of the tools that cults use to like indoctrinate people and keep them in inside of a unique language within their community. And mm -hmm. that's, that's interesting that they that's do that too. A little yeah. like Trump White House too. Yeah, oh, definitely. Yeah, but <laughs> anyway, it's, it's quite impressive, you know, when you read about it, what they, Charles Koch and his late brother managed to construct over time. And, and actually, one thing that comes out of state capture is that they didn't, uh, these various organizations didn't kind of spring full grown from the, the brow of Jupiter. <laughs> they were developed over time. They made mistakes. They figured things out. So this kind of suggests that if the left is going to develop countervailing organizations of equal power, it's going to take some time and some trial and error. That was my conclusion about this. And if you're interested in history, you know, how things develop over time and how people kind of fumble around before maybe they arrive at the solution, uh, the account of how the Coke organizations or Coke influenced organizations have grown, I think it's quite fascinating. Okay, so I, those are the main books uh, for me. Um, and there was a question about what's going on at the K through 12, well, actually K through eight level. And I will try to see if uh, Uncoke My Campus has any more light to shed on that. As I said, it's been kind of an uphill hill battle trying to find out, find out what's going on in other states, you know, not it's not just our fault that it's difficult to find out, as I said, either. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, I think unless somebody has another question. Yeah, I do have a question, uh, Oliver, if I may. Uh, thank okay. you, Dr. Deal. I appreciate uh, the time you spent with us today, despite the, uh, despite the, uh, the issues with the audio. I did have a question. Uh, the Cokes have obviously, uh, th this is a very, uh, cult-like organization. And one of the problems with cult-like organizations is their longevity because of the charismatic leadership that ultimately leaves the field. Are there heir apparents in place that you're aware of to pick up the, uh, the, the continuity on their programs? Okay, uh, that is a very good question. Uh, Charles is 83, so he could go on for a while yet, but not indefinitely, obviously. So he has a son who was treated as the crown prince when he was born about 40 years ago, that's Chase. Um, it's not clear according to Christopher Leonard's book how interested Chase is in mounting the throne and putting on the crown. Uh, beyond that, there are various uh, kind of CEOs at the head of various subsidiaries of Coke Industries who appear to be jockeying for position, but I think it's not clear that the Coke machine will continue on its present course with as much force as it's had uh, once Charles goes. So I don't really know the answer, uh, but that's the information I have that relates to the question anyway. And if you wanna know more about that side of things, I would recommend Leonard's book which is, you know, excellent job of investigative reporting. I mean, this issue has attracted some 
really smart people who can write well and do the spade work necessary to find out what's going on. So we've been fortunate in that regard. I just wish it had started, you know, 10 or 20 years earlier, but you know, I was one of the people who wasn't paying attention either. Partly because they figured out that you're, you get a lot more bang for the buck at the state level. That state legislature, legislators are underfunded and understaffed and therefore very vulnerable to having model bills provided them that have already been written and vetted by lawyers. And hey, you can tell your constituents, I just got a bill passed. Of course, you don't say that it came from Alec, okay? But that's why Alex Hurdle Fernandez's book, State Capture, I think is so important. Because, you know, I, like many other people, I was kind of focused on the national level, you know, the bright lights. But the Cokes figured out that if you focus on the less glamorous level, the state capitals, you can make a lot of headway and people won't even notice. Um, I see, Howard, Howard, you had another question? To follow up on my uh, previous question, um, what's the danger that um, the, uh, the Cokes are via maybe the Libertarian Party because they do um, try and co-opt uh, certain leftist issues like legalization of marijuana, which is on the ballot. I'm wondering how involved they are maybe in those kind of efforts. And if there is uh, maybe a two-part question that whether there's a danger that, um, you know, the Libertarians can succeed in co-opting uh, real, you know, grassroots, uh, green and, and socialist uh, parties and, and people's movements by, uh, you know, selectively supporting, uh, you know, issues like criminal justice reform um, and uh, decriminalization of, of drugs and, and even, uh, you know, their anti-war stance, uh, like Rand Paul mm -hmm. sometimes, uh, you know, does, Rand Paul got a bouquet yeah. of flowers from Code Pink once, as I remember when he criticized <laughs> On warfare, so so uh, if you could talk a little bit more about about that, that's maybe that's yeah. That question. <laughs> Follow up question after that, Patrick. Thank you. Okay, uh, yeah. Well, they're certainly trying to do this. I mentioned the Libre in Initiative. Mm. They're trying to appeal to Hispanic voters. They're definitely trying to peel off voters, uh, you know, in various uh, constituencies. No mm -hmm. question. Um, how successful they'll be, I don't know. They've been pushed, they've been fighting against the drug law that the libertarians have, I think ever since it started under Nixon. I think that is a sincere commitment. And I used to get uh, the Drug Policy Foundation's newsletter. So there's real overlap there, no question. Okay, uh, on the other, like the Libre Initiative, I think that is a political ploy. Uh, on uh, the anti-war business, uh, I don't know how much traction they'll get there. Um, I think on the criminal justice issue, they got a problem because it's provable that they are also supportive of private prisons. So they're in a state of contradiction. You know, <laughs> they're supporting decriminalizing drugs. And of course, arrests for drugs and convictions are a major pipeline to supply bodies to be caged private prisons, right? And yet <laughs> they're saying we don't want more of that, but they're supporting private prisons. So that, that's a big PR problem for them, for them, I think. So, you know, depending on the issue, it seems to me they're likely to make, you know, less, more headway. And on, on the drug war thing, as legalization proceeds, which I hope it's going to do, including here, uh, that becomes less and less of an issue. So that might, you know, take some of the juice out of that issue for them. I don't know. Um, let me see. The other part of the question was. Howard. Oh, okay. Um, oh, I'm okay. addressing it. Um, the political prospects by trying to co-opt, you know, various leftist. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, the, the will is there. I don't know what 
nobody's really open for them, but I'm basically repeating. And it's something to watch out for, for sure. Um, a little bit of co-optation happened here, by the way, with Arizona Public Media. Uh, Arizona Public Media has been donated not that much money by the Freedom School, but uh, David Gibbs has been interviewed by Arizona Public Mich uh, Media a couple times on issues involving the Freedom School. And they've consistently only run the Freedom School's point of view, okay? David Schmitz specifically. They have not screened uh, David Gibbs criticisms. Yeah. So this is interesting from a couple points of view. I mean, obviously public media has a high degree of public trust and the Freedom yeah. School is avoiding that by buying support yeah. from them. And the other problem is that they were able to buy this with just a few hundred bucks, probably because yeah. Uh, Arizona Public Media is hoping for more money from them down the road. Okay, so this is a case in point of uh, how vulnerable public institutions can be, unfortunately. Mm. Yeah. Follow up question. Um, Clay, Clay has a question. Right? Follow up. Oh. You had a follow up. Say yes. Follow up, <laughs> follow up question. Uh huh. Yes, I was wondering. It seems that the intersectionality between uh, peoples and the people's movement throughout the world is growing and having more of a voice. And it seems that uh, with the Green Party United States having so many electors and states in the race right now that this could alone upset the uh, balance. Uh, and it, uh, will let the du duopoly probably have the power again for this next four years under uh, even President Trump if we have the, uh, uh, such a calling as we'd want to see. However, what's the end result as much as we don't, a lot of us don't like the way Trump is, is portraying the country, what's the end result in terms of what's happening with our country since the, the doctrine of discovery and slavery heritage is just going on in terms of so much uh, classism. Well, uh, I don't know if I have a, a better crystal ball than you do, Cara, but I'm worried about the short term right now because Trump has been putting out very clear signals of wanting to take over, you know, permanently, uh, not give up power, okay? So there's the next few months to worry about. Yeah. Then when you talk, you talk about the next four years, the thing that's worrying me is that the global climate change that the Cokes have been instrumental in confusing people about and slowing down the response to is beginning to bite pretty seriously. And I'm concerned about the political effects of multiple disasters. And there may be a very big surprise of you know, coming up in the next decade or maybe even sooner than that. So I feel like the clock is ticking and we're gonna to have to move pretty fast. And it's it's not clear to me that we're going to be able to move pretty fast. So that's what I'm seeing in my crystal ball. It's that uh, we may have limited time to turn this around. Uh, certainly the scientists are warning us quite loudly that that may be the case. So right, the Green Party has the answers and, and uh, neither the Democratic Party uh -huh. or the Republican Party has the platform that has an answer, but the Green Party does. And if the Green Party or the Republican Party gets their way, it's the same end result. That's the point. Green yeah. Party doing a Democrat. Selling job here, right? We got to yeah. get the public that the global climate emergency really is an emergency and that dramatic steps have to be taken now, not by 2050. And instead, you got uh, you know, Biden saying he's not for the Green New Deal, even though in the, de the so-called debate, he actually slipped up and called his program the Green New Deal. So, you know, there's semantic games going on. But, you know, unfortunately, the... Uh, propaganda job that the Cokes have been part of, of sowing doubt and misinformation about climate change has been successful in doing that. And there are a lot of people who still, they're now saying, yeah, there's climate change, right? But I don't believe it's human caused. 
that is a form of climate change denial, right? Because it's basically saying, yeah, the climate's changing, but there's nothing we can do about it, right? This is not human caused. So there's a huge chunk of the population that still has that position. And how to convince people to accept the fact that it is human cause and therefore we can do something about it, that's the tough part. You know, putting the right information out there, like the scientists are doing, is not enough by itself, obviously, after public perception has been so influenced and corrupted by corporate interests, essentially, that would not benefit from you know, doing what we need to do about climate change. It's usually frustrating and also frightening, okay? So that's, that's how I see it. Um, Thank you. I, see, the, the, thanks. Um, does, uh, Clay, do you, do you have, you, you were asking what, Clay is asking, what is the Libre issue? Oh, the Libre issue. Libre. You know, I don't know that much about it, but um, I could check into it. <laughs> I, I given, you know, they're using a Spanish word, Libre, right? Yeah. Which means free. So they're pushing their general theme of freedom. So uh, my impression is that they're claiming that their anti-regulation stance, anti quote, big government close quote stance would create more freedom for Hispanic people too. Okay, but I, I really am underinformed about that. Um, I will check into it. <laughs> so does anybody else have any questions? Well, I, I'm, I'm noticing in crowds that I'm around with that even more progressive religious people are taking the view that human caused climate change isn't possible because man can't change the climate, even from progressive religious people, particularly uh, African Americans in particular. They tend to take the position that they, oh, only God can change the climate. So I'm catching a lot of rejection from even otherwise liberal people on that human beings can cause change. Oh, no. Of course, unfortunately. <laughs> oh, you're gone again. You can hear me? Yeah, I'm here. Very oh, good. Back. Great. So around 1800, there was a huge argument about whether species could go extinct. And it was exactly the same sort of thing. God created each individual species as a separate entity. God would not allow species to go extinct, okay? This was resolved when in fact species were demonstrably going extinct later on in the 19th century, like the passenger pigeon. There were billions of them in early America, pre-revolutionary pre and you know, early post-revolutionary America. So many passenger pigeons they would light on boughs of big trees in the forest and the boughs would break under the weight of the birds. And then within a few decades, there were no passenger pigeons. So people realized, yeah, a species can go extinct. I don't know what that does to my religious beliefs, but the assumption that because according to Genesis, God created each you know, thing in its own kind, I think the phrase is, in the King James, that God would not allow a species to disappear turned out to be wrong. Well, you know, losing the passenger pigeons was very sad. Uh, losing the planet <laughs> would be way worse. And I guess people, you know, I don't know what to say to people who have that belief, uh, except that, as I said, that's what people thought about species extinction. They were wrong. Whatever the Bible says, however you interpret it, species go extinct. And there are a lot of them going extinct now. And the scientists, you know, using uncontroversial science, explain the mechanism which is causing global warming. It was known in the 19th century, you know, this is basic atmospheric physics, long before people started arguing about climate change. And, and incidentally, I don't know if this would impress people now, but it impressed me when I heard of it. Edward Teller, you know, Edward Teller, the so-called father of the H-bomb, 
a Hungarian physicist who was vehemently anti-communist and quite conservative, delivered a speech in 1959, I think to the American Petroleum Institute in New York City. He said that uh, the outlook was very good for the industry for the next few decades. Unfortunately, there was one drawback. The emissions caused by the industry would gradually cause the global temperature to rise. Okay, so to me, knowing that Edward Teller said this, because he was a scientist, you know, he knew the facts. He knew how things actually work in the physical world. You know, he told the uh, Petroleum Society this, they didn't listen. You know, I suppose some of them looked at it as a cost of doing business. It's not gonna be that big a deal. Well, here we are, what, uh, 61 years later? Turns out it's a very big deal. Um, the other aspect is that people are very ill-educated in science in this country. Science literacy is very poor. Um, so it's a problem talking science to people because it's an alien discourse to them. And uh, I guess the other one is the, the uh, kind of psychological finding well, these are all dis dismaying things. I'm not offering anything hopeful. But the reality seems to be that the smarter the person is, the better they are at marshalling arguments and cherry picking facts that support their position, rather than it making them more able to think critically. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? This is really too bad. Anyway, so I guess the bottom line there is that uh, you get what's called motivated reasoning. You have a goal you want to reach, okay? A conclusion you want to reach. So you find the arguments and you pick the evidence that will support the conclusion you want to reach instead of actually thinking uh, from kind of square one about whatever it is you're discussing. And we all do this. It's a basic human tendency. So you got people who feel they're religious. Uh, they have their group is loyal to their church and to their scripture. Uh, it's important to them to stay in that group. Um, they have a, a passage in scripture which seems to say that it's impossible that what the scientists are saying could be true. I mean, you've got a lot of things to overcome there. And uh, there is a scientist in Texas, I think at Texas Tech, who's a Christian herself who has been doing presentations on how to talk to Christians, fundamentalist Christians who believe in the, uh, you know, the sacredness of the scripture and you know, inerrancy, all right, and all that, how to talk to them in a way that they can actually hear. And step one seems to be to say, I am a Christian also. <laughs> I can't do that, I'm not. So I read her stuff and I think, boy, I hope people who are Christians and are scientists and have the guts to do what she's saying are gonna do it because it, it's important. And the hour is getting very late, okay? So I don't think that amounts to a solution for what you're up against, Clay, sorry. Just well, some... as, as a former fundamentalist myself, I can tell you the problem is the rejection of evolution opens the door to an attack on science in other areas. If they're wrong in this area, then well, they could be wrong there too. If they've got it, and of course we, they saw it or we saw it as a bias that they had against the uh, religion, or against the religious view. We actually had the idea that scientists were actually working towards promoting atheism and uh, so once you once you that once you whittle down that trust in science by attacking evolution, then then it's open open season on anything else. Right. So they're able to separate out. We, they said, well, they, they break science into parts instead of it being just different disciplines and with the, within the whole, it's different parts that can be accepted or rejected. You, you, it's no problem to reject this part of science and reject that part. Right. Yeah. Um, well, I grew up in Chattanooga, Tennessee, about thirty minutes from Coast Gone again. 
confusing you again. Um, yeah, you get a blanket rejection of science, sure. And I think you're absolutely right. It's connected to uh, science backing the uh, evolutionary view of uh, life on Earth. Um, so Maybe we can take this as a sign from uh, <laughs> our technological overlords, if not uh, the gods of technology, that uh, <laughs> it's time to stop accepting questions. <laughs> Yeah, we, we've had some we've had some very good questions and we've really enjoyed your answers. All your good thinking there on on yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you, Patrick. Yeah, thanks. Yay, we got you back for a sec. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Howard, everyone. Thanks all. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good to see you, Kara and Alice. Bye. Thank you. You too, Oliver. And Deb and 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 all uh, yeah, all who are here. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Okay, thank you yep. so much, Patrick, for for this presentation. And uh, maybe we we uh, we we will ask you to come back again sometime. <laughs> okay, we'll see. Sounds good.